to four. Organization. <laughs> Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You are listening to the most informational packed hour of Garden Focus Radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. Find the right size to fit your digging project. Visit powerplanter.com. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us to talk gardening for the next hour. Whether you are listening through your radio on one of the 16 stations that we are on broadcasting our program in 2020 or through a radio app or through the website, our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com. Underneath the Season 4 tab or podcast replay or in-studio video replay, we thank you for that. I'm your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is all about you. We are here to help your garden grow better, to have healthier trees, to maintain your landscape, and your yard, indoors and out, also preserving what you grow. There are several ways in which you can reach out to us. You can send us an email anytime, and our email address is gardentalkradio at gmail.com. You can certainly send us a tweet at uh, at TWVG show or just simply hashtag TWVG, and we'll tweet back at you. You can follow us on our Facebook page, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, or you can jam your fingers in the phone and give us a call at any time, 24-7. And our phone number, <clears throat> and we'll get back to you. We'll call you back if we can't get to you while we are on the air because our, our phone lines get pretty hectic around here. So we will give you a call back. You can call us 1 800 927 7469. That's, uh, you can simply uh, remember 1 800 927 SHOW, 1 800 927 S H O W. Well, we have a big show lined up for you as we do every program. We're going to go over what seeds to start indoors and what not to start indoors and the reasons why in segment one. In segment two, we're going to talk about five things that trip up a new gardener and sometimes all gardeners, and we fall under that category as well, some of the items that we will cover uh, <clears throat> we've uh, had problems with. And our guest this week is author and uh, of Turn Here for sweet corn, uh, and organic farmer, Atina Diffley, will be with us. And we'll get to as many of your gardening questions as possible. So let's get into our topic. Our first topic of the day is what seeds should we start indoors and not start indoors, and why do we want to do those particular seeds? So many people start seeds indoors to get a jump start on the garden season. Areas... Um or a short growing season, or maybe you just want to make sure you're growing a certain variety of vegetable or um, to extend your season on either side. So there's some some crops you do not want to start indoors, and there's um, many reasons for this, especially things like potatoes. You're going to start those from a seed potato. Sun chokes, those are started from the tuber. Uh, tuber, just like the potatoes are, yeah. And um, then, carrots and radishes, those are very tender seedlings, so you want to, and radishes only take about 30 days to grow, so you want to make sure that you are just planting those, direct sowing them. Um, beets, you can start in thin, but it's better for direct sow. So beets are a cluster seed, so if you look at a beet seed, it looks like, to me it looks like a little uh, chunky ball of dirt, but it's a cluster seed. So there's several seeds in that one cluster, so when your seeds do sprout, you want to trim them back. And and, the, and it, that holds true for the beet seed. The beet seed is related to the Swiss chard seed, which is the same family that has a cluster, but you don't have to thin the, the Swiss chard no, out. Swiss chard you don't want to thin out. Yeah, because it, the more prolific plants, the more plants you get, the more Swiss chard you get. But the beets you got to, otherwise you're going to have very small to almost no bulb development, and that's the purpose why most people grow 
roll the beets. And then these hardier uh, root crops, parsnips, turnips, rutabagas, you don't want to start those indoors. You want to um, you want to just direct sow them. And you have a tip for starting the carrots. Yeah, well, with the carrot, with, with all these root crops, uh, like you said, that if we start them indoors, and there are videos online of people doing this, you're removing your tender, you're, you're taking the roots out and you're damaging the roots, which is the purpose of the plant uh, and it's just easier to direct sow at the correct time and so you don't have to transition them outside do that hardiness pr uh, procedure with the carrots uh, the easy way to do that is if you're in a raised bed or or garden or anything outside make your drill or your, your trench plant your seeds dust the seeds over with a small amount of soil because that is the seeds are not that large and do not need to be buried very deeply and then cover uh, water it in and then cover it with a piece of cardboard or a two by eight or some lumber and what that uh, what what that accomplishes is preventing moisture from wicking away from the seed the seed coat uh, uh, and then it germinates quicker and more successfully a higher rate of germination because the seed is not just exposed to the elements it's actually protected with that cardboard or that lumber and then after about 20 days 21 days which is the typical germination rate for carrots. You want to remove that board. You'll see a bunch of white stringy things. You're good to go. Uh, not a problem, and that really increases your germination rate for your carrots by about 80%. And this holds true if you want to do it with uh, parsnips as well. Those are some more of a, a challenge to some people getting those started as well. Mm -hmm. um, so you also root crops such as cucumber, melons. Well, they were not, uh, not root crops, but the viney crops. Viney crop, yeah. Sorry, viney crop, cucumber, melons, squash, pumpkins, things of that nature, zucchini as well. And then direct sowing things like corn, beans, whether that be pole beans or bush beans, those need to be direct sown as well. And then peas. Um, and Swiss chard, as we talked about in regards to um, the beets and how they're of the same family. And then there's seeds that are, are good to start indoors. And actually, my um, department director came up to me saying, asked what we had started, and she had wanted to know if we started our tomatoes yet. And I said, no, not at this point, um, but because she wants to start hers. So, But many of you may have already started your tomatoes. Now, now, when we say these are the best to start indoors, you don't have to start anything indoors. You can go two options. You can direct sow them, and, and Holly, you can tell your story, or you can go buy them at your independent garden center. You don't have to do any no, of these. This, this a, lot, is, a lot of times people do it because, A, it gets them in the mood for gardening in the spring. It's something, or late winter, or whatever. Um, but also, maybe they... Their independent garden center doesn't carry a certain variety of, say, tomato or brassica or... You have a better selection. You have a better selection, yeah. You can buy the seeds, you can start them. So if you're like a big fan of the Cherokee Purple Tomato or something, and you can't buy that through a start, then you can start indoors. But you can direct sow it, and that, that's what I grew up doing. I grew up in, in the city in southwest Milwaukee, and we would just throw our seeds in the ground on Memorial Day weekend, and yeah, that's what we did, and we just... We, that's how we no, grew. no starting I had, anything. I had no clue about seed starts. Yeah. So let, well, let's talk about what does well if you choose to start plants indoors here. Uh, we can talk, obviously, tomatoes work very well. Mm -hmm. uh, anything in the brassica family. The so that's like broccoli, cauliflower, kale, uh, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, kohlrabi. Yep. Uh, peppers, uh, they do take a while to germinate, uh, but they do work. And... Uh, it, and we find it very successful because you do get that variety that uh, you do not necessarily get at the garden center. Uh, eggplants, the same way. Leeks, uh, herbs, uh, leeks and onions. Herbs, uh, it, those are very patient plants mm -hmm. because they take sometimes up to 30 days to germinate, and you think nothing's going to happen. And then finally they do emerge from I the soil. I want to say real quick about the kohlrabi is that you either want to start it from seed yourself or you want to purchase it from the indoor, from the independent garden center. Starting it directly in the in the ground as a seed can be a little bit difficult. Yeah, we've never had great success with yeah. that direct sow with the kohlrabi. So we're going to focus on the starting them inside because you're not damaging the root because the root 
is not the edible portion. If you've never seen a kurabi, it's an alien type of yeah. vegetation where it's a little stem and then it looks like a baseball and then it's got these long tentacles of leaves and limbs coming off of it. So, And there's a red variety, a uh, burgundy variety, and then a, a, a green, greenish light green variety. Yeah. Um, and there's small ones and there's gigantic ones uh, that can get you know the size of almost a volleyball uh, in some instances. So... Uh, other things that we can start indoors, we can start in in any type of device. Yeah, you want to th- th- think about this. So this would be something like um, you could use a one of those party cups. Mm-hmm. If you've, you or yourself like to indulge on the weekend, enjoy the party cup lifestyle. Um, or you can use like sour cream containers, yogurt containers. The biggest thing to think about is the size of the container. So you may see something online social media it's like oh i i can start my seeds in egg cartons well you can but if you think about the size of an egg carton each little egg carton spot those are very small so those seeds are going to dry out faster and also you're gonna have to probably transplant them pretty quickly yeah the goal is to plant and have the, the more soil you have the slower it's going to dry out. The least less soil you have, the quicker it's going to dry out. As well, it has a uh, the amount of humidity in your home, or your greenhouse, or your garage, or your shed, wherever you're starting these at, greatly dictates the evaporation rate of your soil. Now we use the Root Maker Grow trays, and we've got a coupon TWVG, and you get 10% off your order. They've got grow bags as well as these very unique, uh, durable sells uh, planting trays of 18, 32, 64, 72, 105 uh, cells, and they air prune the roots. And instead of getting the root bound or the wraparound roots, uh, they have a very uh, vigorous root system when you grow them in the root maker tray. And the more hap- more roots you have on a plant, the healthier and happier it is. So that's what the, we use. Yeah. If you go to the website, look at the root maker trays, you can see how the... The bottoms are different than like a, a plastic container or whatever. Well, what kind of soil, what kind of medium are we starting our seeds in or what is best? So you want to start your seeds in, you can do a potting soil, a potting mix, a seed starting mix. You can do uh, direct compost, just directly into compost. But you want to make sure that you have some sort of fer- slow release fertilizer, especially if it's a potting mix or a seed starting mix. Or you want to make sure, and you also make sure it has some sort of, uh, it can be easily, it, Drains well, but holds moisture. Yeah, if you use the peat pellets, those are great, really well, works well. But you want to you want to feed those plants with some type of slow release liquid fertilizer, or compost tea, whatever the recommended rate is. Go a quarter of the strength, uh, because after about three to four weeks, the plant has used up all the energy that nature has produced for it in the seed coat. And now it has no inner, no no nutrient value in those peat pellets, and the plants begin to look spindly and uh, sick uh, because they don't have anything to feed off of. Uh, also, let's talk about the option of heat mats. Sure. So heating mats are not necessary unless maybe you're growing in a cooler area, um, like a garage, basement, greenhouse, greenhouse, breezeway. Then, if you're growing it in your home and you're about 68 to 70 whatever degrees. You're fine, but if it's in a, an area that might be cooler, the temperature might be inconsistent. That heat mat is going to aid the germination, and you don't want to use like a heating pad from your bathroom that you put on your back when it's sore. You want to use an actual heat mat, and then that way you can control the temperature and it's um, evenly distributed. And finally, uh, grow lights not necessarily required, but do make a tremendous difference if you are limited on ambient light. And when we talk about a grow light, we talk about using the Happy Leaf LED grow lights um, uh, from Happy Leaf LED. They have a very well spectrum light availability and a good footprint and a great warranty and they don't lose intensity like tube lights and we have found nothing but phenomenal success with them uh, but you can use a south facing window a three porch window we grew for years out of uh, a west, west facing window uh, we just rotated the plants every evening as they grew towards the light so some things to keep in mind uh, when it comes to what to start indoors what not to start indoors yeah. if you're listening for the very first time and we have a hundred five archive shows available for you to download and listen to from the past three seasons and you can find them by searching the wisconsin vegetable gardener podcast on your favorite podcast platform or we will make it even easier for you to find them send us an email to 
gardentalkradio at gmail.com and in the subject line put past season and we will send you the link. We'll be right back. Do not go anywhere. We'll be taking about, talking about five things that trip up a new gardener and sometimes all gardeners. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, help your trees grow better, make that grass look greener and preserving what you grow for indoor and out. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. We here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardens understand that healthy soil is always the key to a successful garden. We know that chemical fertilizer burns carbon out of the soil and kills the micro life needed for a healthy soil ecosystem. No worries. Chicken Soup for the Soil by Dr. Jim's will stimulate life in the soil and supply all the nutrients most fertilizers neglect. Rather than force-feeding water-soluble chemical fertilizer, we suggest feeding the microbes a smorgasbord of 100% bioavailable nutrients that your plants can consume when they need them. Chicken Soup for the Soil is an amazing fertilizer that will increase the quality of all the fruits and vegetables you grow. Perfect for gardeners, growers, and farmers. To find out more about Chicken Soup for the Soil and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot C-O-M. The number one One key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed-starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants. To multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds, RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code TWVG at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. You can bet the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mel's also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mel's today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Power Planter Earth Augers, Ivy Organics, Root Maker, Pomona Universal Pectin, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Pro Plugger, Tomato Snaps, World's Coolest Floating Rain Gauge. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird.
Welcome back to the program. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Knew you'd hang around to press to uh, have a conversation with you about the five things that trip up new gardeners and t- sometimes all of us. We all have problems with the things in the garden that causes uh, problems, but uh, a lot of new gardeners face difficulty when it comes to gardening because they have fears and uncertainties about the procedure. And what and we're, we're we've done. We've been guilty of several things on this list. And the first one is time. Will I have enough time? Do I have enough time? I don't have enough time in order to do this. Well, gardening is, for many people, is a hobby, a weekend uh, hobby, a weekend activity. Uh, and, you're, you know, you're trying to grow some stuff. But... It's just like any activity, just like any hobby, there's time invested, whether you're car collecting, golfing, you go to the bar for fun, whatever that may be, you've in, you're, there's time there's invested in it. also going to be some cost, too. Yes. Yeah, so, and that's something to keep in mind is that you can garden for cheap and you can do it on the weekends or a hour every other day after work or whatever, but it does take some time and it does take some consistent time and some patience. Um, and that's the biggest thing is people think, okay, this is my first year gardening. I'm going to grow this, this, and this, and this. Okay, I planted my seeds. Uh, I'm good. Now this stuff should just grow, right? Like my na- That's what my neighbor does, right? But your neighbor might have 15 years of gardening experience versus you in your first year. And that's the thing about gardening is that it's not, it's not something that happens instantaneously. Um, and you're not going to learn it your first year. Well, and that's the thing. And... and- to go along with that, uh, you know, people, you with anything in life, you've got to put some effort for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not going to throw the seeds in the ground. You're not going to buy a fixer-up car and then uh, expect you to be able to um, just go ahead and set it in the garage and it fixes itself automatically. It, it doesn't work that way uh, when it comes to anything in life. Right, for sure. Um, so another another problem is I don't have much space or any ground. So there's a few different scenarios there that you can take care of that with. One is containers, the strawberry gardening. If you use the strawberry gardening method, make sure you're following the actual method and not some random blog post you read online. You want to get the book, whether it be uh, you purchase it or through your library. Um, there's community gardens and are gardening under the Happy Leaf LED grow light. Those are some really good options. Yes, uh, and then uh, other things about uh, a new gardener or some gardeners of, of, of many years is the uh, fear of not knowing everything and the killing of a certain number of plants. Right, like, you know, join the club, basically. Um, all, any gardener from us to Joe Lampall to P. Allen Smith, um to yeah anybody we you know uh, your local university extension office no one knows everything and we're all learning every plant in every season so do we kill plants we absolutely kill plants do we try to kill plants no but it's it just happens it's part of um it's part of the world of gardening you yeah you're not going to learn everything your first year again um or your 20th year Uh, Maybe my plant does not look good. What is wrong with it? First thing to ask yourself is, are you watering too much? Not enough. Um, Then that's typically a a common problem is inconsistent watering. That is the answer. Consistent watering is the answer to a lot of gardening problems. Right. If you're, if somebody's, if we ask, you know, do you water too much or not enough? And the answer is yes. Then, you know, stop doing that. Uh, Figure out which one you're not doing or or doing too much of. Or you say, oh, I'm supposed to water them. Yeah, uh, that's the other thing. Uh, people get hung up, and, and even some hobby weekend warriors get hung up on what does partial shade loving plants mean, and is it okay to plant those in full sun? Well, um, no. Partial shade loving plants, they want to have partial shade. They need a little bit of shade to grow the best. Uh, full sun might cause them to bolt or seed or want to create seeds in the right conditions they want full sun but based on the we're talking about partial shade loving plants right okay so partial shade loving plants want shade um if they have too hot or too much sun they're not going to do well they're going to look wilty they're going to be sad that's why you want to make sure that you have you follow what whatever that plant says uh, yeah, partial shade uh, tolerable plants in some instances. There's, there's partial shade loving plants and then partial shade tolerant plant, tolerable plants, which means that they will tolerate some 
partial shade, but would prefer full sun um, if at all possible. And we plant some of these cooler weather crops in that partial shade conditions because they are daylight sensitive and they are... Um, uh, heat sensitive as well. So we want to uh, figure out what we have going on there. Now plants like beets, beans, cabbage, leeks, herbs, carrots, chard, kale, all can be grown in partial shade. However, those plants will not produce to the magnitude that they would if they were in full sun. Leaf lettuce, spinach, plants of that nature, you want to plant in somewhat partial shade because then you're tricking the plant to think in the day length is not as long and you're keeping it a little cooler as well when it comes to that uh, uh, planting in partial shade and uh, full sun. Right. What, so what, we're going to talk about growing yeah, suns. Yeah. This, um, this, this gets a lot of people hung up on what it means and, and all of that. So the USDA hardiness zone map, or some people call it the growing zone map, um, is a guide to help you know what plants and and what plants um, when your frost your last average frost date is and it, even in this in the fall when your first average frost date is and this will give you an idea when to start seeds when to plant certain crops um, so it's all based off of that so for example ours is mid April to early May and that doesn't mean that mid April we can go and put our tomatoes in the ground that's not correct that means that when we decide to start seeds we're going to back off from that date. So say it's April, I think it's April 15th or something. For, for our zone. Now, it's yeah. different for yeah, everybody. For ours, but yeah, I'm for, for, for ours. everybody. It, yours might be March 15th. Yours might be June 15th, what have you. So we back off from that date. So if our seeds are going to take four weeks to start before we want to put them in the ground, we're going to back off four weeks from that date for example, and then we base that off of when we're going to put them in the ground. So these are things that you can look up online. You can put, you can Google search USDA hardiness zone map, put your zip code in your favorite search engine, and you will find that information. So, and then another question is, um, is how do I know what information that I can trust and follow? And this is very important. We are in a world of information on the internet. Whether it's right or wrong, it's clicks and likes and it's subscribes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There is a lot of clickbait out there, and it's gonna see, you're going to come across a feed that says this. If you do this, or just a, a video or something, if you poke holes in a banana and plant it, you're going to grow a banana tree. And that's not always true. If there's a million views for that video, and that's the only video that person has up, and there's no information about that YouTube channel... It common sense tells you it's clickbait. Right, pretty much. So the biggest thing is, is there's a lot of trusted resources, but one, university extensions. Mm -hmm. Those are proven. Anything that is um, put out by Master Gardener, proven. Um, anything that is put out by anything we recommend. Well, an author. An uh, author. Yeah, yeah. Somebody's wrote a book because wrote a publisher, book. or they, you know, they, they have a reputation they uphold. If there's YouTube uh, channels such as ours, and there's many other great YouTube channels that have hundreds and thousands of videos, cross-reference. Cross if you see us tell you one thing, go see if somebody else has told you the same thing, and then look, see if it's print somewhere, and then you can kind of go, okay, there's four or five sources that tell me to do X, Y, Z. Probably it's a pretty good recommendation to do X, Y, and Z uh, for that particular you know situation. Gardening magazines as well. That's good information. Um, home magazines, what have you. So if it's published, if it's something that somebody had to put work into to contact a publisher and get approved, it's going to be good. Well, that's uh, some of the things that hang up a new gardener and sometimes uh, a, an Every, every every day type of gardener. Soon it will be warming up. Spring is just around the corner. And you want to make sure you can enjoy your yard without sharing it with beetles or grubs. It's time to start thinking about controlling those beetles or grubs in your garden or your yard. There's all sorts of information out there about Japanese beetles in the Midwest. And there's been a lot of talk in the news regarding the Japanese beetles. Grub gone can be applied to turf or garden or on ornamentals to control grubs and lessen the impact that beetles have on your yard this summer. Easy to use, apply with any commercial spreader, and irrigate into the soil. You can find all this information at phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. Biologically tested and will specifically target grubs and other beetles invader, invaders without harming beneficial insects.
When we come back, uh, do not go anywhere. Uh, author and er, and uh, organic farmer uh, Tina Diffley will be with us. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show, a program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. Do you tweet? Send Joey and Holly a tweet to at TWVG show or just use hashtag TWVG and they will tweet you back. Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at powerplanter.com. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit blueribbonorganics.com or call 2 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. You can bet the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardeners phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. Seed Savers Exchange has been saving, preserving, and sharing heirloom seeds since 1975 and today continues to provide those seeds to gardeners just like you. With 600 plus varieties offered in this year's catalog and 18,000 listings on their exchange, their gardener to gardener seed swap, Seed Savers Exchange is keeping cherished seed varieties alive. Visit SeedSavers.org to request a free catalog or to purchase seeds online for this year's growing season. That's SeedSavers.org. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit IvyOrganics.com. 24-7, 365. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is your place for all things gardening, canning, radio shows, digital magazines, and more. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following: Phylum Bioproducts, Spartan Mosquito, Dr. Jim's, Nasala Kabucha, MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop. Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. As the temperatures begin to warm, now you can start thinking about how and what you need to do to liven up your property, your landscape, your garden. And Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center has everything that you possibly could need in order to accomplish the goals in which you have forth for your property. They have 40 varieties of bulk material from gravel to sand to wood chips to compost and everything in between. They have a knowledgeable staff. They can cater to your landscaping needs. You don't want to cut your grass? They can do that for you. They don't do it for free. I mean, it's a service. 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield, just off of Layton. You can call them anytime at 414-282-4220. Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, the place that has everything that you need. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the program. So glad you've hung around. You want to listen and uh, learn about from our guest this week. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest. Atina Diffley is an organic farmer, public speaker, and author of the 2013 Minnesota Book Award winner, Turn Here Sweet Corn, Organic Farming Works, a memoir based on Atina's life running the Gardens of Egan Organic Vegetable Farm. Welcome to the program, Atina. Oh, hello. So glad to be here. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day to join us on the program, and not only enlighten Holly and myself, but uh, all of our listeners across the country. 
Uh, we want to start with uh, where did the ideal for your book, Turn Here Sweet Corn, come from? Because everybody has these very unique stories about how certain things in life inspired them to take that next step or, or create that uh, masterpiece uh, of their uh, that they've shared with people. Well, it's the garden, and you know you have a gardening show, so I'm sure all your listeners know how inspiring the garden is, and just that daily interaction in the garden where you're just seeing nature right there, and its relationship to food was is so exciting, and my customers don't get to experience that, so they were real hungry for those stories. Uh, you when when we uh, was there actually a a sign that said turn here for sweet corn or or was this yeah right okay. right at the side of the road we had a roadside stand for thirty six years in Egan Minnesota so that was the introduction to turn into the the roadside stand. What is turn here uh, sweet corn all about? What's the the when when our listeners get the book? What are what are the what's their expectations when reading the book? Well, it's really about our relationship with the earth, the plants, the animals. It's a love story. It's a lesson in entrepreneurship. And it's even a legal thriller uh, because we had a lawsuit with the Koch brothers. So people really enjoy winning and getting empowered through that whole story. But, you know, fundamentally, it's about the relationship we all have with the land that feeds us, whether or not we ever know where that land is. Yeah, some people think that the uh, you know food comes from aisle nine at the grocery store, and that's simply <laughs> not the case. Um, and that's what we make it very. Uh, our, our niece and nephew are, are, are nine and, and five now, and they are very aware of where things come from, and are excited when they get to go to into the backyard to harvest what they have planted. Yeah, we had a couple of experiences in our farming career that profoundly changed our life. One of them was losing our first farm to development. And when that happened, it, it was an ecological collapse. So we saw firsthand how we as farmers were dependent on all these other species in our landscape that we had really taken for granted. They were quite invisible to us until they were gone. And then they were very visible in their absence. So that's a big part of the book is going through that experience and helping, letting the readers see that firsthand themselves. Yeah. Um, through the character's experience. It's amazing how one domino that you may not think is going to affect anything can greatly have catastrophic mm -hmm. exp uh, ex 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 you know, results. Yeah, once the bulldozers, they removed every tree, every bush, every blade of grass, they even sold the living topsoil. And once they did that, any agricultural crops that we had in the vicinity, we got overrun by disease and pests. Uh, we couldn't. We didn't have any life to hold the water when it would rain. It would run off. So we quickly saw there's all these ecosystem services that we were just getting from the other species on the land that we took for granted. Never again. Now, with that going into that, the diversity. What is soil biodiversity, and why is it important to all types of vegetable growers? Yeah, it's pretty exciting when, when you start learning about what's in soil. It's a very complex ecosystem. There's bacteria, algae, fungi, protozoas, earthworms, insects, small vertebrates, plants. Uh, most of them aren't even visible to the naked eye, but they're providing all these ecosystem services, water storage and purification. We hear about climate change every day now. Carbon sequestration is a huge service of the soil biodiversity holding the carbon intact in the soil so that it won't leach with the rain or wash away. It's the complete recycling system for nutrients. When things die of any species, they get recycled in the soil and then taken up by the plants again. Once they're taken up by the plants, they're intact. So it just goes on and on and on, but the complexity of it is immense. Uh, pest and disease control is often a big part of soil management, that it has microbial life in it that will help manage the pests and disease that could attack our plants. And, and you bring up a very uh, detailed uh, plan there of how nature takes care of itself, and and that's what we encourage when we talk to gardeners at their backyards, that you don't need to go buy gallons of harmful chemicals. Just do, you know, let nature take care of itself. Yeah, there's some things that we have to kind of interact with a, a little bit, but if we allow nature to do what nature has always done and seems to know how to do this stuff pretty well, uh, then 
we don't need to use those harmful chemicals that can disrupt those procedures that have been set in, in, in stone for, for since the beginning of time. Exactly. Nature has those systems worked out. And we've disrupted our, our systems so much in the United States and most of the world that when you first stop using chemicals, at first it can be really challenging because those systems aren't in place, but they will return. Um, so if you can get through those first couple of years, it usually gets a lot easier. Now, you um, you had won a huge ecological lawsuit, um, as you mentioned with, with the uh, Cook brothers. Please tell us more about that. Yeah, we were threatened. You know, we lost our first farm to development, and we moved to a second farm, got it, put, put it through cleanup, and had it certified organic, and we're running a successful farm, and we were threatened by a crude oil pipeline owned by the Coke Industries. So what we did was we intervened in the legal proceeding, and we argued that an organic farm is a valuable natural resource, like a wetland is, and it should be uh, avoided when feasible and protected if it could not be avoided. So that was just really fascinating because we were able to demonstrate in court all these ecosystem services that are provided by organic farming systems that go beyond the food produced because the it, the fertility system is based on soil building and increasing carbon. We could show carbon sequestration. We could show reduced water runoff and pollution in the rivers, et cetera, et cetera, because our insect management system is based on having beneficial plant species to attract beneficial insects. We could show benefits to society in pollinators and intact ecosystems. So we could just show all of these systems and then quantify these ecosystem services. So in a court of law, to protect something, you have to show how it will impact human beings. That's how our legal system works. We can't just say there will be a loss to nature. We have to show the loss to humans. And that is what we did. We showed that these agricultural systems, organic agricultural systems, are providing more than just the food. So that was just really wonderful because it educated the judge and it educated the Public Utilities Commission and that is now affecting decisions they've made since. So one of the big things I really learned in that case was how, as citizens, ordinary citizens, we really have these opportunities to educate people who are in decision-making positions and influence how things are decided and what decisions are made. So do get involved. Do write letters when you have those opportunities. When you see an opportunity like this to change a law, take it. And we were able to create an agricultural mitigation plan for organic farms in Minnesota that does protect them now. And other states have copied it. Wisconsin is one of the states that have copied that plan since then. So you have that plan now, too. And many um, energy companies have copied it. Well, and, and with you being able to, and, and many people know who the Koch brothers were and are, uh, their pockets go bottomless when it comes to financial and money and you were able to defeat the goliath let's say so to speak because you had the proof because you showed in a court of law this is what is actually occurring and this is what's going to happen if you do x y and z and, and then uh, correct me if i'm wrong you had like 4500 letters written in, in, in support of you for this uh, case as well? Well, yeah, we, we turn to our customers, and we're just a local farm. We only sell in our community here in the Twin Cities area. But we turn to our customers and just ask them to write a letter to the judge telling the judge how they would be affected if our farm was gone. And we said, just write about your personal experience. These letters were amazing. There were letters from doctors who prescribed organic food to their customers there were letters from chemically sensitive people who said the food from our farm was the only food that didn't make them sick um the there were letters from people that said four generations of their family had been eating food from this farm and that they planned their every summer family reunion in august so they can get sweet corn and watermelon from here what? But those letters were very important because the judge has to read every single one right. of them, and they were a big part of educating the judge. To, to put him in a position that he could make a 
decision that was not biased one way or another, but was actually according to the law, because sometimes we see yeah. these judges lean one way or another based on influences uh, that are, is not always the, the correct way to do such. Yeah, and what you just said is really important. It, you have to give the judge data that they can make a ruling on. Otherwise, it would be against, you know, they can't just say it because they believe it's right. You have to give them the evidence to to substantiate the decision that they're going to make. Absolutely. Well, Tina, how can our listeners find out more about you? Where, where can they go on the web to, to find more and, and get your book? Sure. Well, they can read my book, Turn Here Sweet Corn. It's a fun way to learn about all these topics because it's written like a novel. It's a true story uh, memoir, but it's a fun read. Uh, they can go to my website, which is my name, atinadifley.com, and they can find links to the book there. They can find uh, excerpts from the book. And I actually have all of the legal documents from the pipeline case on my website. So if anyone is dealing with anything similar, they're free to download those and use any language from them that is useful to them. A great resource. Well, Tina, we greatly appreciate you taking time and coming on the program and, and sharing your story with Holly, myself, and all of our listeners across the country. My pleasure, and thanks for working with gardeners. They are some of the most important tasks in the world is growing food. Absolutely. Well, when we come back, it's going to be all about your garden questions and our garden answers. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at dripworks.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. You are listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program to help your garden grow better, have healthier trees, maintain your landscape and yard, indoors and out, plus preserving what you grow. Trim Bin turns any chair into a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with a static brush and mirror finish collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. Blue Mel's has been one of Milwaukee's premier garden centers for over 60 years. We have always been committed to putting our customers first. When there is demand, we stock it. When there is an idea, we grow it. When there's an opportunity, we build it. And when there is a need, we deliver. Our family continues to offer you the industry's best garden and landscape products and services. The same as my parents did when they first started the business back in 1955. Visit Blue Mel's. Quality and service are the roots of our business. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Drip Works, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the program. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Thank you so much for hanging around. We've got a bunch of your questions that we are going to answer. If you've got a question, you can certainly send it to us uh, via email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. You can also uh, drop us a phone call. You can jam your fingers in the phone and call us at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. And we can get your questions 
question answered. If you can't get through, certainly leave a message and we will call you back. So um, this is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Did you have a question or comment? Uh, yes, I'm a first-time gardener, and I'd like to know how long or how big my seedlings need to be before I plant them in the actual ground. Well, that's a good question. A lot of people fear that they are going to put their seedlings out too soon. And a couple of things you want to be aware of is, one, um, it's a common question. So a general rule of thumb is when a seedling has about three or four sets of true leaves, it's large enough to go outside in the garden after the hardening off process. Now, when I say three or four sets of true leaves, that's the canopy beginning to develop. Uh, not the very first set of leaves are going to be the uh, the the uh, seedling leaves and then as you see two sets of leaves right and left and then front and back and right to left then that plant is going to be um, adequate to go outside and begin to grow and uh, let's talk about how let's talk about the hardening off process real quick so uh, once you've got a seedling that is established at the correct amount of you know, true leaves then we want to transition it outside, but going through a hardiness program, we or system. We can't just take it from the grow room, plant in the garden, and everything is wonderful because that's not going to work. Right. So you want to about a week before you're going to plant your seeds, every day you want to put them outside for about an hour and increase that time. So uh, for about a week before, so the first day an hour, second day a couple hours, uh, third day three more out three hours, and so on uh, up until a week before. And then you want to leave them outside the night before you're going to put them overnight before you're going to put them in the ground. And this acclimates them to the to the outside climate. Does that help? Okay. Yep. Yep. Now, does this apply both to vegetables and herbs? Yes, it does apply to vegetables and herbs. Uh, when we, depending on the type of vegetable, if it's tomatoes or peppers or eggplants or the warmer weather crops, we want to make sure we plant them outside during the appropriate time when the soil temperature is 50, 50 55 degrees at soil at, at root zone. The herbs are going to need a much warmer soil temperature, the 60 to 65 range, as those are very warm weather crops. Uh, but the p transitioning them outside through the hardiness, uh, harding them off uh, is the same for herbs and vegetables uh, for, for both, yes. And the, and the same amount of leaves are needed to get those outside at the appropriate time. And uh, with that question, uh, we would also advise if you can direct sow the plants outside without having them start indoors, then you don't have to worry about the transitioning period. You can allow nature to take care of them uh, themselves, but we do... Um, start a lot of indoors and that's a very good question and a good follow-up to that all right well thank you very much you've done a lot of help well thank you for giving us a call and we appreciate that and you're always welcome to get a hold of us anytime and uh, we will go to another question here uh, you can you can call in just like that last caller did at 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-SHOW, any time, day or night. Uh, Holly, what's the next question on our list that we have gotten in uh, for uh, the show here? Um, you're going to have to tell me. <laughs> uh, here, the uh, question is, I've got ash from my fireplace. Is it good to put in my raised beds or in the tree, in the ground? Is this correct? Have I understood this procedure uh, correctly? And um, you can add wood ash to your soil in small amounts. It does sweeten the soil, raises that pH level, um, and it, it can uh, add to depending on what you want to grow. If you raise the pH level too much or too alkaline, uh, the soil which is uh, harms the plants. It doesn't like when there's too much alkaline in the soil. You want a pH about seven, six, eight, seven, two, somewhere in that range, um, depending on what you're growing. The more acidity, uh, acid loving plants like blueberries uh, want about a four and a half to five kind of four and a half five somewhere in that range but you can sprinkle it across your garden uh, it doesn't hurt it at all but you want to do it sparingly and uh, not to add too much because it can cause growth problems on your vegetables um, so Jane asked, um, how do you keep squirrels from eating all the bird seeds well, from the feeders? Well, a couple, yeah. of, couple of things that you can do here. One, uh, if you've got a thin metal pole that they are climbing up or transitioning up, what you could do is 
uh, remove that pole and attach a slinky to the bottom of the bird feeder so when they crawl up, they get a hold of that slinky and they can't climb and they're just bouncing up and down. Some people spray it with cooking oil. Cooking oil, um, lubricant of a variety of different organic and inorganic um, consistencies. Uh, the, the, the other thing you can do is you can buy bird seed that has heat or um, chili powder infused into it, the very hot chili powder, uh, because the birds cannot taste that heat. However, squirrels do have those sensory uh, mechanisms in their nostrils and mouth in which they will eat that and essentially burn their mouths and they will find elsewhere to consume bird seed, preferably Aww. your neighbors. But you can get rid of them from eating your bird seed that way. All right. Um, so here's another another one. Um, they they want to know: Can I use pressure treated lumber for raised beds and building raised beds this year? Just trying to find the best lumber to use. Can I use pressure treated? Well, pressure treated. Uh, we are. If you uh, we encourage you to follow us on our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com, where we will be transitioning our in ground garden to uh, to to raised beds. However, uh, we are going to look for pressure-treated lumber. Because it doesn't contain the arsenic as it did back in the 90s. Uh, this is copper-treated. There's a copper material that is treated with this lumber. And copper, there is some microscopic amounts of copper that's in soil. Uh, and people are concerned about the leaching into the soil. Well, um, there's not that much to be concerned with with the new pressure-treated lumber nowadays. And pine... Let, let, I'm just pulling arbitrary numbers here because I don't know the exact scientific uh, rot procedure on pine. But let's say a pine uh, raised bed will last three years. Pressure treated, you may pay a little bit more for the lumber, but you're going to maybe 75% uh, to 100% longer. Maybe you'll get five, six years out of that raised bed with that pressure treated lumber. And um, it's well worth the investment. And we will certainly, when we construct our raised beds, we are going to use pressure treated lumber because there is not that concern of the toxicity in which it once had in it in the 90s, that arsenic. So, yeah, go ahead and use the pressure treated lumber. Works very well. We encourage you to do such. Um, and if you can, and money is not an option, Western Red Cedar is the best because it's rot proof. Proof, and that's the best uh, scenario, but we all don't have necessarily that option or the availability to that particular type of a uh, lumber. Uh, here's a question, Holly. This is for you, Holly. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, Holly is a multi-award winning Wisconsin State Fair canner. Uh, question here. I had two pints of uh, jam... Uh, two, I had two pints jars, not seal, when I made uh, yesterday, uh, made jam yesterday. I had heard you can reprocess it and try again. Today, I... Um, Okay, yeah. So for jam, that might be a little bit tricky because jam does need that heat and then the process to set up. So I think it would be okay with jam. But if you're canning, like, say, salsa or chutney or um, uh, pickles, whatever, then you can reprocess it. Um, you can try out the jam. It should be okay. But what you want to do is you want to start with everything at room temperature, and that would be the water the jars, put a new lid on the jar, and then once you have, then you put it into the canner, get the water boiling, and then once it's at that full boil, then you would start your timer. Well, for, for people who are not really that into canning or new to canning, what is one of the main reasons why a jar may not seal properly during the canning procedure? Is there a, here's an always, this is the always reason why? Um, Sometimes it's because maybe your the top of your jar has had some moisture on it from when you were filling it. It could be because you we always check our jars. We check the rims to make sure, like with a, just our finger, to make sure there's no like little teeny dents or cracks or something in it. So that could be why. Sometimes it's just how it works out. And and when we talk, what what is the lids that you recommend? I know there is a quote unquote reusable type of lid versus the I, the metal lid that many of us are familiar with. I just use the regular metal lids. People like the reusable lids; um, they have a lot of success with them. But that's something that I've never decided to try. Now it's not necessarily re it's it's a gasket that is yeah, so that you, you have, have to replace, to, right? Okay. Yeah. So there's some a part part you still have to replace, but as far as part of it, you don't. So. It's really up to you. I I guess I just don't have the patience to try to, to figure those out. 
uh, monkey around with them. Okay. Uh, Nathan has a question. He is in Green Bay, and he wants to know, I have failed miserably at gardening for the past few years. Well, we're sorry to hear that, Nathan. Uh, so last year, I did nothing but uh, work on getting better soil. Okay, that's a good step. Uh, there are this year, my goal is to start earlier with better seedlings and seeds. All right. My question is, can I put my seed from seedlings out in my greenhouse right away, or must uh, I keep them indoors? I live in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and I'm thinking of starting tomatoes the second week of April. Thank you. Well, you can you can start them. Uh, well, yep, yep, but in Green Bay, that would be about yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. It's all can. it's all based as we talked about in the second segment. Your growing zone uh, with the greenhouse, uh, you the transition period. You're still if you're taking it from inside your ambient seventy degree home, and you're taking it outside into the greenhouse. Um, it depends if your he- greenhouse is a heated, climatized greenhouse, and uh, many greenhouses uh, of small stature are not. So. It would be questionable to do such if the conditions of long range is not sustainable to above freezing. Um, you want to be aware of that. Uh, you may want to keep them in longer inside in the in the house and then do the hardening, hardening off procedure. And then you can allow them to hang out in the greenhouse until it is actually safe and frost-free to put them in the ground at the appropriate time in the Green Bay area. Now, here in Zone 5A in southeast Wisconsin, we plant ours the uh, Memorial Day weekend, uh, most instances. Sometimes we get uh, them planted a little earlier. But I would uh, be very cautious of just putting them out in your greenhouse if it is not climatized due to that um, hard cold that they can experience. Tomatoes are a very tender plant and do not do well when the temperatures drop below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, that's all the time we have. We greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us on the program. Uh, we are we certainly appreciate your time. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com is our website, and you can click on the Radio Season 4 tab at the top of the page, or you can send us an email anytime at gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and we will send you the link to this show, and uh, we can get any of your additional questions answered. You can check out past shows. Uh, in the garden videos uh, while you are on the site. Tell your garden friends that this program is on the radio as it is how we advertise and let everybody know. You can find all of our podcasts at our website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, and we certainly appreciate your help spreading the word about our program. Join us next week on the show where we will be talking about the difference between heirloom, organic, hybrid, F1, F2, and GMO seeds, as well as the real story behind companion planting and why it's not completely true. Our guest will be host, PB, a host of PBS's Growing a Greener World. Several, several of you have reached out to us and said you, we really want to have you have this host on your show. Joe Lampo will be with us, and uh, we will answer more of your garden questions. That's all next week, same time, same station. Until then, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.